This is Steve Kaufman. He speaks 20 languages. No, yes, if there is no motivation, this will not continue. Therefore, we must accept this uncertainty. I think it is very, very important. The only combo is to have a good time. The only thing that I can do is to acquire the words. I believe not that I can learn the grammar. Because in life, everything is opportunities. And there are some entrepreneurs, let's say. De... We are your day job. I will not be the day guy. I will not be. Yeah, I would say in terms of legitimate polyglots, I would definitely say Steve Kaufman's a legitimate polyglot. But is Steve a genius? Or can anybody with the right motivation learn languages like he did? What's interesting to me is Steve's method for learning languages happens to be very similar to the method I stumbled upon to learn Japanese well enough to do business here in Tokyo. Of course, Steve is at a totally different level, having applied his method to 20 different languages. Here we talk about how he learns languages, how this method is actually supported by the research of a famous linguist, and we get into several other topics, like the way this fits in with how the brain actually works. Okay, well, I'm a 75-year-old grandpa living in Vancouver, British Columbia. And for most of my career, like for seven years, I was in the diplomatic service. And then most of my career has been in the lumber business. But since the age of 60, I've become very much involved with language learning. So since the age of 60, I've learned 10 or 11 languages, including Russian, Korean, Arabic, Persian, you know, uh, Romanian, uh, Greek, a whole bunch of different languages. I do that on Link, which is a site that I created with my son, lingq.com, which is where I like to learn languages. And it's just become like my third career, languages in terms of learning them, in terms of, you know, uh, obviously I have a YouTube channel with quite a few subscribers, and I try to encourage people to have fun with their language learning. So I think that would probably be pretty surprising to most people that you started learning all these languages after the age of 60. Um, you know, one, because there's this idea that it's, it's much easier for younger people to learn languages, but two, language learning is basically a skill the, you're improving the skill of acquiring new languages. Right. Can you I think so. talk a little bit more about that? About Yeah. So, I mean, when I was 60, I wrote a book about language learning, and I spoke nine languages at the time, and now it's 20. Uh, so you do get better at learning languages the more you learn. Uh, you get better at, at, you understand how to learn. Uh, you, he, you have heard more sounds, so the brain is more flexible. Uh, you're used to different constructions, different ways of saying things, so the brain is more flexible. So you get better and better uh, at language learning. So I, I still think language learning comes down to finding a way to enjoy it, bombarding your brain and trusting that your brain will learn in time. I like the way you said that, trusting the brain, trusting that the mm -hmm. brain will learn the new information. Last time we talked about how the brain is basically a pattern recognition machine. Exactly. And you had you had told me about this neuroscientist I had never heard of, uh, Man Manfred Spitzer, right? Yeah, Spitzer. Yeah, Manfred Spitzer. Exactly. And and he, he yeah he he's I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist. He is, and maybe there's other neuroscientists who disagree with him. But what he says, I I find it's it very much applies. Like basically, if we look at the brain, in order for us to live we have to have some ability to anticipate what's going to happen. So we're in a situation with friends. If we go to a, a restaurant, we know what's going to happen. We know roughly what they're going to say, what the waiter's going to say. We have to. We can't be starting every situation from scratch. That's what the brain does. It creates patterns to help us cope. And in order to create these patterns, it needs lots of input, lots of stimulus. And so that's exactly how we learn languages. We don't learn the specific words that are on a word list or the specific grammar rules that are in a book because they're taught as a, at us and now we're, we have to do a test on them. The brain gradually starts to identify certain patterns and then starts to naturally produce the language. Now, some degree of grammar instruction or reading about grammar or being corrected can help you, uh, you know, help the brain perhaps, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is to have to trust that your brain will, will start to develop patterns and just keep on bombarding it with stimulus. Did you formulate your method for learning languages around Krashen's work or did it have any influence on what you were doing? Or 
So Stephen Krashen is a linguist who says that people don't learn language by reading grammar rules or studying lists of vocabulary. We acquire language only when we hear a sentence or word and understand the meaning, usually thanks to the context. For example, watch this scene and pay attention to the word kane. Kane you might have noticed that he's looking at his wallet at first, and then he's at the ATM, and then this guy is looking at his wallet too, and you realize kane means money. Krashen says that this realization is important, and learning this way is called comprehensible input. We've tried everything else. We've tried grammar teaching, drills and exercises, computers, but the only thing that seems to count is getting messages you understand, comprehensible input. I, I would have to say that I didn't discover Stephen Krashen until, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, after I had learned a lot of languages, primarily through listening and reading. So Krashen confirmed my experience. And Krashen, what's so great about Krashen, if you want to read a book about language learning, you buy Krashen's book, it's like 110 pages. It's all there. I have, on the bookshelves behind me, all kinds of learned books on language learning, applied linguistics, all kinds of theories and studies and stuff. And it all amounts to nothing. It's all reduced to that one little book of Krashens. So he's the great simplifier. He is the great, you know, Gordian knot solution. He says it all and he backs it up with research. And he, he confirmed what I found. Like when I studied Chinese, which was the kind of the first language, well, French was first and I did a lot of reading and listening. But with Chinese especially, if I compare myself to the other diplomatic students in Hong Kong learning Chinese, I did better than they did. I learned in a year what they took two years to learn. So, I learned Chinese. Because I was forever reading. I was forever going to the bookstores to find books with word lists behind every chapter and just constantly ingesting the language. So uh, whatever he said, he sort of explained what I had intuitively discovered. Our desire to, to you know, understand this potentially meaningful message, that's what drives our language learning, that's what helps us learn. Meaningful, such a big part of language learning. And that's why these you know, role-playing sessions where you sit in a classroom and pretend you're at a restaurant or at the post office are so meaningless because that's not meaningful. And that's why I think it's best to delay starting to speak until you have enough vocabulary and a sufficient level of comprehension that you can actually have a meaningful conversation. And then you have a meaningful conversation and at the end of it you're exhausted, but you've actually been communicating meaning. You haven't been pretending to speak the language. And I thought that was very interesting. One of the things that Spitzer says is, you know, if you're reading to a child, uh, you, it'll, be, it'll be more beneficial if you read about something that is of interest to you and if you read it with enthusiasm than if you read a boring children's book, a book that you find uninteresting. The child will notice that and the child will pick up on something that you're very interested in. And you don't necessarily have to dumb it down too much because the child will pick out those things, those phrases, those words, those structures that the brain is ready to you know, absorb, identify, form patterns around. Uh, and so therefore, when we get into a language, we don't have to start with, hello, how are you? My name is, the colors, the, you know, the different fruits and vegetables. You can almost start anywhere. But obviously, it helps to have repetition. So, you know, in the case of Link, we have these many stories where we deliberately have high frequency verbs, which repeat a lot, because that gives you a better chance, gives the brain a better chance to start forming those, um, those patterns. But fairly quickly, you want to move on to something that is interesting, getting back to the story about reading to your child. You know, if there's enthusiasm, resonance, interest, the brain is going to learn better. I kind of had this idea in my head that there has to be some way to indicate to the brain the necessity of what you're trying to learn. For example, when you're trying to learn, learn a language, right, these, there'll be these other peripheral indicators saying, hey, this is important, you need to know it. So just like you're saying, 
if you're reading something you're interested in with enthusiasm, then the child will pick up like, oh, this is this is pretty important information. Is there anything else like that? Let's say indicators of, of trying to get the brain motivated to to pick up on the patterns. Of course, if you're in like a better mood, if it's a topic you're right. interested in. All of those things, better mood. If, you, if you're listening to something and you like the voice, like I do a lot of listening and uh, very often, you know, your typical language starter book, the voice is, they're bored. It's boring, they're bored. Hard to listen to, hard to learn from. If you have a voice that you like, if they're telling a story, you know, with, with passion or whatever, it's easier, easier to learn, easier to pick up on the patterns. Uh, when I was learning Chinese, I listened to these comic, uh, these, they had this comic dialogues and they were so much passion and so forth. And I attribute the fact that my tones in Chinese are actually quite good because I was listening to all of this very rhythmic, you know, co comedians talking and lots of, you know, banter and stuff like that. So that helps. Um, you know, and so far as watching videos, I, I don't think videos are, I think videos are very encouraging, stimulating. Uh, it's not as language intense as listening and reading in terms of learning. Uh, but I find that if you watch a movie in a foreign language and you understand nothing, I think there's limited benefit. Uh, if, let's say you know 10% of the vocabulary, it's possible with, it seems to me intuitively, with subtitles in your own language, you might pick up more of the words. And you might have that sense of being able to participate. If it's a sitcom, if it's a you know family and you're watching Netflix, a series, and every night you're together with the same family in Turkish, and you're picking up a little bit more because you can understand what they're saying because of the English, that's not a bad thing. It makes it more of a fun experience. Probably you have to be fairly advanced in the language to be able to listen and read along in that language. Now, in the case of Turkish, for example, they use the Latin alphabet, so that makes it a little easier. In Arabic, I'd have a tough time trying to follow along, follow along at the speed that they speak, right? So, uh, I, to me, videos are more like a reward and they're fun and they stimulate you. Uh, but the hard sort of work of learning the language is still, to me, listening and then reading and saving the words and phrases, trying to increase the amount of meaning. We have to have meaning, you know, otherwise it's, it's you've got to have some meaning in there somewhere. Uh, in order for it to be, uh, you know, helpful. Your brain's trying to recognize all these patterns, but at the same time, it's trying to pick up on like, what is the pattern most worthwhile to spend my resources, my energy on, on recognizing? Uh, the, the other thing that's interesting from Spitzer, he points out that the brain is very poor at remembering things. And I think this is often frustrating for language learners. We don't remember things very well. We keep them for a short while and they're forgotten. But what the brain is very good at is gradually by dint of getting all these things that you learn and forget and learn and forget, so the brain starts to form patterns. And so therefore we must always be patient and not be worried because we've got six out of 10. And that's why traditional language instruction is so bad. It discourages people and because we forgot things. And the te <laughs> there was a recent uh, case of a French immigrant to Canada, to Quebec, a truck driver, and you have to pass a French proficiency exam to get your citizenship or whatever. And he, he spoke only French from France. He failed because they had some arbitrary fine point of grammar or two or three, and he didn't get those right. So uh, probably a lot of other people, English speaking Canadians who can't communicate at all in French, they might know those little points, but it's, it's not relevant. It's not relevant. How, how long had you lived in Japan? Nine years. Yeah. So it seems to be the case that despite there being so many resources and services geared towards learning English in Japan, the actual English fluency in Japan is, is not that great. Not Why great. do you think that is? Uh, I think there are many reasons. I don't think there's anything that's intrinsic to sort of being Japanese because I know Japanese people who speak absolutely fluent English. Uh, I think there are, it's how it's taught. I mean, the same is true in Canada, mind you. Uh, I don't know what the situation is in the States, but in Canada, the vast majority of kids that go through the regular English language school system, they have French for eight or 10 years, they can't speak French. Uh, only those that go into French immersion end up speaking French. So it's a complete, uh, it's, I, I don't think it's any better than, than the situation in Japan. I mean, Japan is a Japanese speaking country, you know, there aren't that many opportunities to use English, but the way they teach it, they should focus on comprehension. 
uh, and forget the test. Forget, like all of, in the bookstores, they have all these toic word lists and stuff. I mean, that's impossible. There's all kinds of proof that you can't learn those things. There's, again, a professor at UCLA, Robert Bjork, who points out that you don't want to try to block learn anything. You want to kind of meander, interleaving, he calls it. Learn a bit of that, a bit of this, come back to the first thing again. And, and so this whole idea of block learning these, these word lists is so inefficient. Uh, they don't have fun with English. Uh, you know, and of course, not. maybe many of them will never have fun with English, but if they were if to find a way by catering to their interests, by focusing more on comprehension, uh, by not trying to force them to sit in class and speak to each other in these, uh, you know, English conversation classes, don't worry about these word lists, don't worry about TOEIC. You know, I, I don't think they do worse. Uh, there are some attitudinal things. I think there's a tendency in Japan to sort of say, well, you know, we Japanese are very different, we're very unique. And so, so that they tend to be more reluctant to leave the sort of warmth of their native culture. But they're not the only ones who do that. I mean, you know, North Americans can do that too, you know. Why don't you speak English type of attitude? So the extent to which people are unwilling to leave the comfort of their own culture and just go for it, uh, that's helpful. And people will do that if they're having fun. So here again, I think uh, in Japan, uh, I don't think English teaching is, is that much fun for people. And so they don't do very well. If you're in Europe where you can go 100 kilometers and the language changes, then of course, language learning has a, you know, has more, it's, it's more sort of a natural thing to do. But uh, I think it's method. I think it's attitude, uh, those two things. But nothing would prevent Japanese people from speaking English an awful lot better. They don't listen a lot. You know, you go to Sweden where everyone speaks English. It's not because the Swedish school system is better. It's because every kid in Sweden watches American and English television programs. And so they speak English before they start school. It's input, input, listening and reading, listening and reading. Yeah. It's interesting what you say about leaving the comfort of the culture. I feel like I'm comfortable with that, but I'm at least for quite a while and I've been trying to fix this recently, I feel like my accent and my pitch accent is not very good. You know, I have a pretty heavy yeah. American accent when I'm speaking in Japanese. And I think part of that is because when I'm trying to sound Japanese, I feel a little embarrassed. Like I'm, I'm acting, I'm putting on an act. Something about that was a little embarrassing for me. So I didn't get into the habit of putting this effort into trying to sound Japanese and, and use the same intonation they use. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. First of all, I must admit that I'm not a fan of the concept of pitch. Uh, it's just another thing that to worry about. Uh, I think basically we want to imitate the way the native speaker speaks with the understanding that we won't get there. We won't get there. You know, with very few exceptions. Yeah, I've seen, there's one guy, I've seen him who's Japanese, I would say. There's a few people who sound like totally Japanese. But most people will get, you know, closer to that. You have to be willing to project yourself into that personality. I am Japanese. I'm going to be like, I'm with these other people, they're all Japanese, I'm going to be like them. Uh, I can do that. It doesn't bother me, in French or Chinese, whatever. I'm just, but I, I don't, I don't worry about having an accent. Uh, you know, the other day I was watching uh, golf on television and they interviewed this Mexican golfer. And he spoke English so well, like his use of words was so natural. Uh, you know, at, at least as good as your average native speaker. But he had an accent. His having an accent made it better. The, the use of words, the use of language, correct use of language, accurate use of language, rich vocabulary, all of these things are far more important than accent. And to some extent, if you can do all of that with an accent, it, it's almost more admirable. And, and the reverse of having a really good accent, but not being able to put words together properly is almost worse, in my opinion. I would think that Arnold Schwarzenegger's accent kind of added some yeah. uniqueness and interestingness to him, uh, even though his, yeah. his English is perfect. Now, no, he's a, he's a, a, a yeah, he's a, a show business performer, but I'm talking about business people. Uh, who have a who speaks very well, very elegantly, and have a French accent or a German accent, or a Spanish accent or a Japanese accent, but who really use the language well. That's impressive. Uh, I think trying to sound like a native is is an unrealistic and an unnecessary goal. However, you should be willing to try to get into the flow and the rhythm of the language the way the natives speak it, 
because very often like in Japanese that'll influ influence how they put you know words together because there there's they don't speak like it's not like one two three four five they go one and you know but then two and then maybe three and you know how they are they're a little more uh oh, and you, you want to get into that because that's that's how they communicate so you want to sort of start imitating it basically the 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 key thing is to get a, a huge bunch of input do you think there's a certain yeah. point at which it's helpful to start look at the grammar rules I think, yeah, I think regularly. Uh, it depends on the language, of course. Like, I, I have, I'm not aware of any grammar rules in Japanese. None. I just, people say, you know, iku de sho, iku daro, aista iku, whatever. I just hear what they say and I imitate it. However, there are languages like Slavic languages where there's lots of grammar, uh, where you have conjugations and declensions. And again, if I'm and most of, most of my reading, I do on links. So every verb I see, I can look up. We have conjugating dictionaries, and I just kind of look at it just to remind myself of how that conjugates. But there's no conjugations in Japanese. So since I'm not learning Japanese, I don't know. I don't know. There are you know compared to when I learned Japanese nowadays, you can look a word up and you can have a sort of a grammar reference tied to that word, and so you can get that constant feedback whenever you're curious about a point of grammar. And I think the best time to go at that grammar is when you're curious about something uh, so that you can relate the grammar rule to something that you're experiencing or have experienced. Uh, you can always skim a grammar book and it may remind you of some things. But if you don't have enough experience with the language, all these grammar explanations, they just fly past you. You can't sort of, oh, okay, now I've read all the rules. Now I understand the grammar. It's, that's not how it works. You have to first have that experience and then you can start tagging. You can start identifying, putting labels on some of the things that you have already experienced. So yeah, you do need to review. And you're not, like the brain's not going to notice everything. When we say it establishes patterns, it's going to miss stuff. And so it is useful every so often to skim through a grammar book or some book that explains the language um, or to look up things when you're curious. I do that. I do it in my Persian. I do it in my Arabic. Um, again, Japanese I learned so long ago. I mean, I those kinds of resources weren't available. Do you spend a lot of time just reviewing vocabulary words you've made or lists of sentences? Or hardly at all, hardly at all. Uh, my review is I'll go back to my mini stories, okay? So, you know, we have, in every language at Link, we have 60 mini stories. The, each mini story consists of high frequency verbs and the vocabulary repeats five times within the story. Change of tense, change of person, uh, question, statement, uh, negative, positive, whatever. There's a lot of repetition. That's kind of like me going to the gym. So even if I'm listening to a very interesting podcast, this self-help book uh, written in English, translated into Farsi, the guys, you know, reading it and all that stuff or talking about it, I'll do that for a while. And then I go back to the, the simple stuff and I go over it many, many times. That's my review. And every time I do that, I notice something. I notice some structure or some word that I kind of hadn't yet come across enough times for it to really sock in. Um, I don't really review grammar rules because actually in most languages, there's not a lot of grammar. You know, most, you can reduce the grammar to a very small amount. Uh, there's some variations on the theme, but essentially the grammar, it's not unending. Words are almost unending uh, and, and phrases and so forth. But the grammar is, is, is limited, a limited amount. I don't spend much time on the grammar. Ah, and so far as reviewing words, Again, if I'm on link, if I turn the page, I have an opportunity to review the new words that showed up, you know, on that page or words that are still like, you know, the way we have it. If it's a word I've come across before, it's now in yellow. I can review the words that I don't yet know on that page, but I will only do it with reference to a specific page of content that I've just read or listened to. Uh, I'm not going to go through 300, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 words randomly flashcarding them. It's because I don't enjoy doing it. And, and my big theory is do what you like to do and you'll learn. So people who like doing that, they'll benefit from it. The other thing with flashcards is you kind of get into this trap of, look how much I've improved in the language. I can now re remember 200 flashcards instead of 150. But then, you know, you're not necessarily understanding things more fluidly when you're listening, you're not having an easier co conversation. <laughs> 
<laughs> Grazie. You may not retain them that long either. You may think you know them now. You may not know them in three months. And uh, the other thing is, um, like to me, flashcards, I just go through them. It's just exposure. I don't rack my brain trying to remember it. I don't think there's any benefit in trying to rack your brain. I've never found that. It's the same with comprehension questions. You know, trying to remember whether Mrs. So-and-so, uh, you know, made, uh, you know, pea soup or, or, or roast or whatever. All those details. And what, what happened? Sorry, I don't remember. Just exposure. Just exposure. So in our mini stories, the comprehension questions, we give you the answer. And then we, we give the statement, ask the question and give you the answer. It's just exposure. And similarly with flashcards, I'm not into rocking my brain trying to remember. I just go through them as fast as I can. Just exposure. What do you think about this 1,000 core words idea? Of like, oh, you learn 1,000 <laughs> core words and then you can, you know, you can yeah. go order a coffee or take a taxi, do whatever you need to do. Well, a number of things. First of all, I have found that uh, even if you have X number of words or phrases, you try to learn them before you go to the country, you get there, it's very difficult to remember them, very difficult to use them. You don't know what the other person is going to say. It's, I find it difficult. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I like, you know, a glass of beer, please, or where's the washroom. Those are relatively easy. But even then, if you don't have a sufficient level in the language, you're almost uneasy trying to use those things. Uh, the reality is that, um, yeah, a thousand, the, the thousand most common words will account for 70%, you know, anywhere from 65 to 80% of any given context. That's a fact. However, the most common words, you're going to come across them anyway because they're frequent. The most frequent words are going to show up frequently. The reality with frequency is that it declines on a slope like this, okay? So the most frequent 50 words are very frequent and the most frequent uh, 100 are less frequent. And by the time you get to 1,000, that frequency has dropped way down. And now you have to pursue, and, and in order to have meaning, because the native speaker you're going to talk to knows 50,000 words, 40,000 words, and you have no control over what they're going to say. So you actually need a lot of words. And unfortunately, you know, you can acquire the high frequency words fairly quickly. But trying to acquire all these other less frequent words takes a long time. Lots and lots of listening and reading. So I have never found that to be that, you know, learn in the Pareto principle. If you learn, uh, you know, the 20% of words that account for 80% of content, your, your way to the races. I have never found that to be the case. Even while you are continuing to acquire less, you know, low, uh, less frequent words and doing it through listening and reading, you are also training your brain in the language giving your brain stimulus in the language, the brain is starting to create, you know, uh, patterns in the language. So uh, pursue words, not, not the first thousand, 10,000, 20,000. I'm sure you find that in Japanese. There's almost an endless number of words to learn. Don't you find? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I always just, I had to call the tax office to ask a couple of questions about my, my return. I, le I learned like 15 new words just for that, from that phone oh, call. Sure. Another thing is I think people might have this idea that, oh, you know, everything he's saying makes sense, but still he's probably has some little advantage over me. Maybe when he was young, he learned he was already bilingual when he was growing up or something. Could you tell us a little bit more about your background and sure. uh, I guess how you got into that's it? True. That's, that's true. That's true. That's I'm sure that's true. I was actually born in Sweden and at the age of five, my family moved to Montreal. Uh, and then my parents, who, by the way, are originally from what was what became Czechoslovakia, what was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they said, we're in Canada now, we're going to speak English. And, and Montreal in those days was like one third English, two thirds French. And the two were separate. Right. So we basically lived in English speaking North America. She said, we're in Canada now, we're going to speak English. So we only spoke English at home. But I had heard Swedish as a child before the age of five. We never spoke Swedish again. And my parents would often speak German to each other. So I heard those languages. So I'm sure that helps because it, it makes the brain more flexible when it comes to language learning. But I, I would say though that I have been to many of these polyglot conferences and I think you're aware of these polyglot conferences that they have. They had one in Fukuoka, there was one in Montreal, they've had them in, in Europe. And, but I was speaking to a group of people in Montreal, an auditor, auditorium with 600 people. And these are all polyglots and when we have our 
conferences in the evening and we have flags with all the languages that we speak and these people have like 8, 10, 12 flags on their chest. And I said, how many of you were raised in a multi, bi or multilingual family? And I think out of 600 people, six hands went up. So it's, it's undoubtedly an advantage, but not having that background is not an insurmountable problem. It, it all comes down to, to attitude, to enjoying the process, to thinking you can do it, thinking it's important to do it, all of those things. If you look at the successful polyglots, many of whom, like me, have a YouTube channel, the one thing they have in common is that they all enjoy learning languages. And I think that the enjoyment becomes comes first. Now, you could say, well, they enjoy it because they're good at it. Uh, maybe. Obviously, people like doing things they're good, they're good at, right? Where they have success, yes. But I think it starts with them liking it. And because they like it, they do well, then that reinforces it. They like it, they do well, and because they do well, they like it. And so, you know, it's, it's a virtuous uh, circle. So finding ways to enjoy it, whether it be anime for Japanese or whatever. And the problem with the traditional textbooks is that the, the texts they use are boring, the drills they give you are boring, the audio you listen to is narrated by a person who's bored, so they do everything possible to make lear learning, say, Japanese or Korean or any other language, not fun. And, and I think if I were a language teacher, I would have one goal. I'm not going to test the kids. I'm not going to drill them. I'm going to find ways to, ha to, make, to enable them to have fun. That's my only goal. And if they have fun, they will improve eventually. Oh, the difference between someone who I met in Japan who was really good at English and not so great at English was the people who are not so great, they would always kind of speak about their English language learning as like, oh, I need to learn English. I need to, I, right. oh, I really should get back to learning English. But the people who were really good at it, it was just kind of something that they did that was, that was fun. And, you know, oh, they would just talk about the movies they like to watch. I mean, you know, friends or cheers on the US television or Harry Potter have done more for English learning than all the British Council and all these other institutions that that they want to spread english no question yeah what what do you think about friends actually i actually taught english uh as a part-time job when i was in university and i would always recommend friends to people i thought friends touch touches on so many uh situations that at least most of it would actually probably appear in that person's life, hanging out at a coffee shop with friends, hanging out at a person's apartment, going to a birthday party, going to a, a baby shower, whatever it might be. Absolutely. It's the best. It's the best. Now, I don't watch Friends. I've never watched it, but I know it exists. But I know the kind of show it is. And uh, I've watched shows like that, say, in Turkish. And the idea that you get together, however frequently you watch it, you know, you might be binge watching it every night of the week or once a week or whatever. So you get together with the same people. It becomes almost like your family. It's very powerful. I felt that way about this Turkish series. I wasn't, my Turkish wasn't good enough to benefit from it, but where you kind of get together with the same people, you become familiar with these people and they're talking about everyday situations. And, and so you kind of get into it. You're almost part of that family. I think those are, those are great, great shows for, for language learning. If, if people like them, if people don't like them, then of course you know, watch Tom and Jerry or something, you know, you got to find things that, that people are interested in. How would you define fluency? I had done this other interview with an, he was an air quality specialist and a professor in animal science. And so I was mm -hmm. kind of, when I was asking him questions, I was stumbling over my words and I would, I would, had so many ums and like, uh, you know, uh, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I, I just sounded like an incompetent speaker. So, right. Someone might be like, this guy has a great American accent, but he's not very good at English. <laughs> so it was just something I was thinking fluency. about. Like, how would you just yeah. define fluency? Obviously language is for communicating. Like you, I think comprehension is huge. If you're in a conversation, if you're speaking to someone in English in Japan and you get the sense they don't understand what you're saying, that makes, that makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, and you can tell the person doesn't understand, especially doing business. So I would switch to Japanese. Uh, so comprehension is a big part. You have to basically understand just about everything to be fluent. 
when and fluency implies speaking and speaking well but it doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes uh, you know I talked about that French truck driver who passed his who failed his uh, citizenship exam because of whatever grammar thing that he did wrong he's still fluent in French so you can be fluent and make mistakes uh, and you can be fluent and make some basic mistakes like if you're speaking Spanish and somebody will point oh you got Sarah and the star wrong and you know yeah but to me, that's not such a big deal. I have Russian, I have, we have a Russian employee who is very fluent in English. He can go in there, he hey, was getting specs for developing sawmill software and stuff, and he's totally fluent, but he doesn't use articles. You know, <laughs> this computer, you know, he's fluent, totally fluent. He understands everything. He can get into detail of the customer's requirements. He can explain technical things. He's totally fluent, but he misses a few things. That, that don't exist in his language. So uh, I think fluency is a sense of total comfort in the language, total comfort at getting your you know, ideas across. Even if you have some mistakes that you always make and you're never ever gonna correct, it doesn't matter. And, and it's essentially understanding what the other person is saying, not having to say, I beg your pardon, beg your pardon. So to be comfortable in the language, natural in the language, but it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean, it certainly doesn't mean that you have no accent. Uh, you can be identifiable as a foreigner. You can make typical English speaking mistakes, typical Japanese speaking mistakes. But if you're like totally able to express yourself, you understand what the other person is saying. As far as I'm concerned, you're fluent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot more reasonable goal than <laughs> having zero accent and never making a mistake. Uh, it doesn't exist. Like the, not one person in a, a thousand is going to achieve that. Obviously, you're, you're super passionate about languages. Is there anything else you're into in your daily life? Well, I like history. So, and, and of course, the language takes me into history. So, uh, but I would read, uh, I would read uh, you know, Persian history in English and Arabic history in English. And uh, then I read a biography of someone. So the language gets me into and Now I'm discovering. And then I read about the... Uh, you know, Genghis Khan, because that's the whole Central Asia, Iran, Turkey, Arab, whatever. So I, I like, I find, I love history. Uh, my wife is totally keen on golf, so I go with her. And of course, you want to get better. So golf is, a, is, is an interest. You know, for the longest time, I was playing uh, old timers hockey three times a week. But now with the COVID and then because we go down to Palm Springs, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I don't ski quite as much anymore. Uh, I love getting together with the family. I like food. I like wine. Uh, I like enjoying uh, every minute of every day, you know, never a shortage of things to do. And, and I, I did, uh, I really enjoyed being in the wood business and I love wood and there's a lot of wood in our house. And I, I think wood is fascinating to me. If, if one of your interests is history, like what better tool is there than having multiple languages to... Absolutely. Absolutely. And you then have a perspective uh, that's quite different. And say in the case of Iran, uh, I found uh, through Upwork maybe, a uh, person in Iran who's made a whole series of, of you know, content items for Link where she records it and then she uh, she obviously does the transcript and then she has these circling questions for repetition on the history of Iran, Persian carpets, Persian food, you know, minorities in Iran. Uh, this endless supply of, of, of interesting stuff. And, then, and it leads you to other stuff. And I mean, the history of Iran, I mean, it's, 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 we, we learn so little about that in, I don't know about in the States, but in our school system. I mean, we don't learn about, you know, uh, Cyrus the Great and, you know, the whole history of Iran is a great big hole there. That's, it's a huge country, a huge civilization. And same with the Arabs and Turkey and the influence of Turks. And, and then, uh, and so then you, you know, Xinjiang is in the news now because, you know, in China with the Uyghurs, who are the Uyghurs? So then you read up on that and. The Uyghurs, of course, speak a Turkic language, but uh, throughout Central Asia, there were Iranian sort of speakers and Turkish speakers, and you just get into that part of the world, as I did with Slavic languages, with uh, Ukrainian and Russian and Polish and Czech, and the Romance and stuff. So languages opens the door to all, and food, of course, and music. Yeah, languages are open the, the, the road to lots of different things. Make sure and catch Steve on his YouTube channel titled Steve Kaufman, Lingo Steve, and check out his website built for applying his method to learning languages, Link. That's L-I-N-G-Q dot com.